I'd just like to welcome everybody to our webinar tonight from MHPN. This is an interdisciplinary panel discussion. The title is Working Together, Working Better to Support Older People with Mental Health Issues. I'd like to welcome our audience who are now logged in from every state and territory in Australia. Our panel tonight um, are three, Ms. Julianne White, Dr. Nancy Pachana, and Dr. Rod McKay. Julianne is kindly um, logging in tonight on this webinar from our hospital bed. She's been unwell recently, but has ga gamely agreed to present tonight. Dr. Nancy Pachana um, and Rod McKay will follow on from Julianne. I'm your facilitator tonight, Dr. Michael Murray. This webinar is hosted by MHPN. MHPN is a Commonwealth-funded project supporting the development of sustainable interdisciplinary collaboration in the local primary mental health sector across Australia. We currently support over 450 local interdisciplinary mental health networks. For more information or to join a local network, visit mhpn.org.au. The session outline. The webinar is, comp is comprised of two parts. The first part is a facilitated interdisciplinary panel discussion following a PowerPoint presentation. The second part are question and answers from you, the audience. We have already received many questions um, so far, but you are welcome to posit any questions in that bottom right-hand cor corner. The ground rules for tonight, please ensure that your sound is on. That does not apply to, to panelists and the volume is turned up on your computer. If you experience problems with, with sound, please dial toll-free toll 1-800-142-516 on your telephone landline and enter the passcode 40151365. You will see that message appearing frequently in the bottom right-hand corner. You can minimize the text box if you're finding it distracting using the arrows above and beside the text box. If your specific question is not addressed or if you want to continue the discussion, feel free to participate in a post-webinar online forum on MHPN online. The learning objectives for tonight. At the end of the session, participants will be able to recognize the key issues in the assessment of older people experiencing possible mental illness. Recognize the key principles of intervention and the roles of different disciplines in treating, managing, and supporting older people experiencing mental health, health issues as well as functional issues. And thirdly, to better understand the merits, challenges, and opportunities in providing collaborative care to older people with mental health issues. We will now move on to our first panelist. It's Julianne White, a social worker from the Riverina. She is had experience as a nurse and a clinical mental health social worker across the River Arena. She is presently um, doing a doctorate. She is the founder of the Amaranth Foundation. Julia, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'll just go to the next slide. Hang on a minute. Slide eight. Um, so just looking at... Um, Oh, hang on a minute. Are you disconnected from the server? What I'm presenting tonight is their view of a social worker in looking at the case study that we had, which was Morris. And what I wanted to do first was actually say, you know, sort of to place social work into the context that we're doing here. Uh, whereas social work is concerned with the way people interact with their environments. We're using a series of social systems, life stage development and human behaviour. But we also look at the fit that a person has with their environment across those three levels, the macro, the mezzo and the micro level of a person's life and their capacity to function and lead meaningful lives across all those sectors. But we're also concerned with the biopsychosocial bio issues. Um, and you choose tools and ways of engaging with a person to build their trust and rapport. Um, initially with Morris and to gain his trust and rapport quickly, which I believe is really important, you know, we have to engage with him with great regard and dignity and compassion. Sorry, I'm just getting some things on my page here. Sorry. Um, it's also important to educate him about the role of a social worker because as a lot of you know that, there, that a lot of people don't know what we do in mental health or how social work, psychology and psychiatry and even the role of a GP you know, works in collaboration together. So I think that's really, really important. The other things we're concerned with, Morris, is the um, negotiating, looking at his presenting problems and how he's negotiating this really important stage of his life and the fears and issues that he might be having. 
I'm also concerned about his family and other significant caregivers interact with him and how they also perceive Morris's problems and strengths. Um, but prior to any formal assessment, just a minute, I'm getting some feedback here. Is everyone getting feedback? Is that causing a problem? It's not causing a problem, Juliana. Oh, fine. good. Well, I'll keep talking. Thank you. Yes, that's good. <clears throat> oh, good. So I'm just trying to move the slide across. Michael, can you help me here to the next slide? Do you want slide 9 or 10? Uh, 9, that one. It's on 9 now, Thank yeah. you. Prior to any formal assessment tools, what I've got up here is that from a social work perspective, I think it's important to understand the context of Morris's life and the things that provide his life with meaning and purpose. And what I find from a social worker is a great way to start with a genogram, looking for his strengths and his weaknesses in his immediate circle, looking at his relationships, the losses, gaining an understanding of how he perceives and values these relationships. And then, of course, moving on to the echogram, which is an important part of a social work uh, inter intervention, which introduces us to Morris' broadest connections in his community and the supports and roles they play in his life, and also to gain an understanding of the value and importance Morris places on these connections, which is terribly important to get a context of Morris. We also look at his family and cultural sensitivities, because I think that's really, really important to understand how his family relate, how they communicate, how they cope with change, who they, and who are the key people in his family and how they relate. And I think when you get a sense of all of those things in that initial engagement with the person, that you can then move on to other questions and other assessments, very, perhaps with more um, empathy and more compassion, and also have things to relate back to. But also to be checking into Morris constantly so that um, you know, he's really okay with the things that you've actually asked him about and your interpretation and the way you're hearing and seeing things is actually exactly what he meant. Um, and what I've got up there on the slide is, you know, I think it's important to actually gain his perception of what his significant issue is, because if you've all read the case study, there's lots and lots of things that are really impacting on Morris and how he feels about where he is in his life. Some of the presenting problems that are really very in your face, you know, there's sort of the evidence that he fell and all those things that we see. But those other intangible things that we don't see necessarily, which are the multiple losses, the fears that he's got, and his reaction to the situation he's facing at the moment. I think it's really, really important to look at his goals that he might have or his hopes for the future. Because as we would all know too, you know, a sense of um, a loss of hope and meaning can actually cause an awful lot of fear and anxiety and problems and can be actually misinterpreted too as depression. So we need to really understand what his hopes and what gives his life meaning. We also need to know how he's coped with change and uh, especially with all the things that have happened in his life and what strategies he's worked, what, that he's used in the past and what's worked for him or what hasn't. And I think that's an important consideration to, to ask him what he's done previously and whether these things are actually going to help him at this stage of his life. But I think we also, with all the losses too, to gently explore his reaction to his wife's death and that of his father, which is also very closely and uh, related to how he's feeling going through now and how he had made, made sense of these debts and the impact that they've had on him, especially now. Michael, could you help me go to slide 12? Let's just so the... Slide 12 now? Yep. So sorry about this, guys. I, after I read my slides today, I thought I needed to no, jump to the end fine. of it. No, that's fine, Julianne. Thanks. It's lovely. It's very interesting. And um, what I've got on slide 12, though, is... Um, because what I thought is I actually had some other things about doing some case management collaborative so, Julianne, care. I'm just getting some feedback from the um, audience that, okay. that, that because of the, of the echo from the hospital phone, uh, if you can just speak a little bit more slowly a bit and more slower? clearly. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I can see that over there. Thank you. I'll do that. So Go ahead, please. Slide 12 up. Yeah, slide 12 is up. Oh, okay. I can't see it yet, but that's okay. No, you're fine. What I think slide 12 is saying is that um, what we might look at, because of where we've gone with all this discussion about trying to really get an understanding of, of who Morris is and some of the issues that have impacted on him, is that maybe at this stage to actually look at some other assessment tools. And the ones that I've used in my clinical practice with older people particularly and those facing about hope and meaning in their life is the, the HADS, the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, which I think is really an excellent tool to use in this cohort, but also the Distress Thermometer, which I think has been well validated in the older population and also with people facing end-of-life issues and, and concerns. 
And so I was thinking after I looked back at my slides that maybe, you know, it's, it's this tension and the rhythm of a, an assessment, you know, is it time now to jump in and do a formal assessment or do, if, depending on how well Morris is engaging with that conversation about his losses and his goals and his perceptions as to whether, you know, to continue with that conversation. And I think that's, you know, part of that, um, the intuition that goes with good clinical practice that says, you know, go with this, don't go into a formal assessment where you might actually, you know, sort of... Um, you know, turn off that engagement, which I'm always very conscious of, especially with older people. And I think with someone like Morris, never to forget the concept that he's been a professional all his life, and it's only he's only been retired 10 years. So he's been a professional, he's been well engaged, controlling his life. You know, he's been in charge, he's the expert of his life, and so we have to show great respect for the expert status that he has on the things that impact on his life and how he feels. And I think constantly go back and check with him to say, look, am I hearing you correct? Is this what you feel? Is this what you're seeing are the issues? And then on slide 13, um, I've got... Moving on to slide 13 Yes, now. thank you, Michael. That'll be lovely. I can't see these slides, so no, I'm guessing. No, that's fine. We have slide 13 up now, thanks. Lovely. On slide 13, I've just got a list of some of the interventions that, from a social worker, as a mental health social worker, these are some of the interventions that we would feel most comfortable with in engaging with, um, with Morris, perhaps in exploring some issues around especially acceptance and commitment which is a very values orientated approach to some goal definition and perhaps you know addressing some of his fears and anxieties. I'm not sure if I put dignity up, dignity therapy up there as well but dignity therapy is also another really wonderful therapeutic intervention to do with people who might be facing end of life because it actually looks at their life, their expert status and looks at the values that they may have had that have d guided their decision making over their, their um, their years leading them to this point. So I've just got a, a bit of a list there. I'm not going to go into them, of course, but they just might be there so that I wasn't sure what the audience consisted of. But, you know, from a mental health social worker perspective, these are the ones we would be most comfortable with. And then going back to slide 10, is that all right, Michael? Yes, I'm just going back to slide oh, 10. Oh, thank now. you. God, it's lovely to have a little helper. <laughs> Slide 10 is off now. Oh, lovely. Now, slide 10, I sort of talk, um, I'm hoping this is what's on the slide, but um, that, that looks at some of that collaborative care that we would be looking at working with other healthcare professionals. Now, I'll just go and grab my other notes. Um, and what we would do would be um, using a strengths and a solutions approach to look at other possible areas of community-based supports, you know, funding if required, depending, and also any reviews by GPs. So trying to engage with him in looking at, from his genogram and the echogram, and looking at the strengths that he's identified and some of the things the community supports, try and engage a conversation with Morris about how some of these could be used to actually support him based on how he perceives his problems to be. Um, and I think also here, you know, as I said before, constantly checking in, rechecking in with Morris constantly, is he okay with this? I find that if I forget to check in with people, I lose them. They just, you know, you can just see that they drop off from the conversation and I think rapport goes from not checking in constantly. They think, you think you know what you're on about. You know, and I know that I would feel like that if someone was trying to um, engage with me, you know, a stranger into my life. Now, I'm really passionate too with doing an intervention with people to be conscious of the rhythm and the tone of the interview so that I'm very conscious listening to how the engagement's happening, you know, the rhythm of the questions and, and how Morris and the people, you know, that how that interaction is happening so that your intuition can come in. You know, as much as we've got to have all that theory sitting there, you know, being able to draw upon, we've actually got to have the intuition that guides our responses and our response to this, you know, individual and this person in front of us. Also important, and I think, I'm quite sure if it's this slide or the next slide, uh, Michael, so if you're able to have a bit of a play with that one in slide 11. But you know, to look at who are the other healthcare professionals who may be out there, because I think it's absolutely key and critical that Morris knows that I know who's out there and that we're going to work together. Because I think if he's been engaged with healthcare in the past, maybe when his wife died or other things have happened to him, that maybe there were some disjointed interactions with healthcare professionals, which you know, at this stage in his life where he's expressing fear and anxiety about his future, he doesn't quite know what's ahead of him, you know, he wonders, is, is, is this it for him? You know, what's the future hold? That he needs to know that we as professionals are going to work well together and we're not going to double up. And so I think that my role is perhaps maybe, I'm not saying this would be in this order, but maybe as the first healthcare professional that might work with Morris post-discharge from hospital, is that I need to know who else could help him and have a good understanding of other healthcare professions, roles and responsibilities and where we cross over and where we complement. 
And I think that's an important thing to check with Morris and let him know that, that this is all, you know, with his consent and permission, that we'll um, work collaboratively together. Um, I think that's all I've got to say on that one, I think. That was lovely, Jibli, and that was, a, that was a lovely presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Michael. Now we're just going to move on to Nancy, Nancy Pachana from Queensland, a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist attached to the University of Queensland as a professor. Nancy. Hi. I'm you? just, I'm very good. You, I'll just move on to your first slide. I'm sorry. Get you up. Oh, I've, I've advanced it myself. Good um, on you. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that's up. Um, I thank Julianne for that great um, intro um, into um, my own bit, which is the psychologist's perspective of this very interesting uh, case of um, Morris. And uh, I, I think that this case really illustrates very well um, the complexities of an older adult coming in for this sort of assessment, the, the complexities of their life history, their um, medical history, and their uh, emotional uh, history. So that's why this kind of a case really lends itself to an interdisciplinary um, approach. So I'm going to speak um, about the case uh, both from a clinical uh, psychology perspective as well as a neuropsychology or um, a cognitive uh, assessment perspective. And, and in saying that, I, I'm going to echo um, what Julianne said about uh, having a biopsychosocial approach to the assessment of the case in terms of instrument selection and um, sort of um, tailoring that to um, the gentleman's presentation even a little bit on the day. I'd always suggest um, with such cases to have, um, you know, if the person isn't quite up to some more complex assessment, to have some um, backup assessment instruments. And then also um, formulation is key. So how are we putting together all of this information to make some hypotheses about what is underlying his current concerns and where we might want to go with both the assessment and the treatment? So um, my next point is that really the structure and emphasis of assessment varies according to the treating psychologist's experience and training. And uh, this is my little plug for uh, having, uh, getting some training like what people are doing uh, tonight because the evidence suggests that for this age group, um, the efficacy of assessment and treatment is directly related to whether the person has uh, training. Um, so I think that knowledge of normal uh, developmental um, life stages as well as then being uh, able to um, distinguish abnormal trajectories from that is really key. Um, and finally, you have to balance this assessment of cognitive and emotional functioning now compared to any kind of baseline assessments. Of course, I wish everyone had a baseline assessment when they were 20 and 30 so that <laughs> neuropsychologists could have a true baseline. Uh, sometimes uh, that may be uh, more difficult to ascertain. And again, it would be good to get uh, collateral information to get that sort of assessment. I'd like to also emphasize here um, that Morris's wishes are really important. Um, here we have, um, you know, a case where you're going to do some neuropsychological assessment. And uh, people may as approach this kind of assessment with a lot of trepidation. They may be saying a lot of things to themselves. So, for example, this gentleman has a potential issue with driving. And when they come in, they may say, is this assessment going to result in the loss of my license? And so I think it's really important to ascertain what the person sees as what may be some potential outcomes to the assessment. And um, this is a new way of thinking in neuropsychology. It's, uh, it's called therapeutic neuropsychology. And uh, this kind of, um, it, there's, there's a lot of research about it. And uh, this kind of uh, approach, um, if, if you look it up online, um, there's starting to be more and more articles about this, about really taking the person and their family's perspective into how the neuropsychological assessment is constructed. Um, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about the setting of the assessment. I think that um, you can obviously do assessments in uh, the person's home, and um, certainly this gives a, a great richness of the assessment. 
Um, you can actually see, you know, how the person is coping in their home, and it can be, give a lot of information. Um, and a lot of times that's how older adult assessments are conducted. I would say, though, that there is the possibility of the environment influencing um, standardized administration of instruments, and so there has to be kind of a balance and negotiation if you're going to do some extended cognitive testing in the person's home setting, just to make sure that you get the best data possible. Um, I think that the interplay of the person's mood and their cognition and the environment is very important. So for example, when you test people cognitively in familiar settings, you will get um, better results than in, say, an unfamiliar setting like the hospital. Um, also, obviously, a person's mood affects their cognition. And again, this makes it really important to have very good instruments with good, good normative data to base your assessment on. So I would say that if you're choosing instruments for older adults, and by that I mean individuals over age 65, you choose instruments, for example, that were developed and normed on older adults, if at all possible. So for example, geriatric depression scale, geriatric anxiety inventory. And uh, just in case anybody's wondering how to assess such assessment tools, a really great resource is called Assessment Scales in Old Age Psychiatry. It's a, a re relatively inexpensive book that gives actual assessment tools in it. And um, so one of these tools I've mentioned on the slide, the IQ code, um, that's in the book. It's, that's an informant questionnaire for cognitive decline in the elderly. Um, but a lot of these tests, um, including various forms of mini mental state tests, are in that book, highly recommended text. Um, now, some specific assessment issues um, in this case would be to determine uh, premorbid functioning, if you can triangulate that um, sort of as a baseline for your cognitive assessment, uh, to compare also the patient's report of issues and concerns versus objective data. So for example, a key differential in terms of progressive um, neurocognitive decline, like a dementia versus depression, is this kind of mismatch between the person saying they have lots of issues with memory and can't do anything, but the objective testing is telling you a slightly different story. I think here we have the issue of alcohol and uh, self-medication issues are, are important, and uh, you'd want to get a detailed history. And there are some specific instruments uh, looking at um, substance abuse in um, older adults. So I, I would suggest um, uh, a, an instrument like that. Driving issues, uh, again, um, you know, you, there are some it, paper and pencil tests are not great for driving issues. Obviously, uh, an OT in a driving assessment is, is kind of gold standard um, for this. But, you know, some useful tests um, include things um, like just simple trail, trail making tests and also uh, gauging some kind of insight into whether the person uh, notices that they have any difficulty compared to family um, reports. Bereavement is a big issue in this case, and, and again, you'd want to do some uh, assessment around that, and also a risk assessment, obviously, um, you know, if there may be some suicidal ideation. And then finally, uh, I think, partly because it's a research interest of mine, capacity issues in terms of uh, financial capacity and capacity to um, look at their own health issues would be key. Uh, and again, looking at issues uh, such as vulnerabilities um, to things like internet scams. Um, now in terms of management, I'll just, um, um, just try to be brief here because there's a lot going on. Um, I think that the management by the psychologist will, will vary. I think that if the psychologist were to do some both either assessment or treatment, that it's really important for older adults who may not be, uh, have been exposed to uh, a psychologist to socialize people into what is the purpose of the assessment, who has access to the results. Um, if you're doing therapy, what sort of therapy are you doing, what will it entail, how long, how many sessions, you're stressing a collaborative approach. Um, you know, these are really key in terms of making sure rapport and the direction of the therapy go well. Uh, and you always want to be, as, as Julianne said, checking in, making sure you're in touch with uh, the patient's goals. 
And then, of course, there's collaborative case management with other uh, healthcare professionals, and, um, and you really want to make sure that all of the party's short and long-term goals are clear to everyone else, and then if anything changes, for example, an acute medical incident, that everybody's just kept up to date. I, I think that that's really key. So from a neuropsychological perspective, really the battery should be tailored to suit the referral and the, and the initial formulation. And it really, um, whatever cognitive test you give, it could be five minutes, it could be an hour, um, you know, is really tailored and, and you're, you're not over-testing, um, but you're sampling enough to make some sense of, of what's going on. Uh, I've already mentioned choosing appropriate um, instruments for older adults and really be clear with the person uh, what you're doing with that data. And to give feedback, unfortunately, data suggests that people don't get regular feedback when they're given assessment, and this may be particularly true for older adults, and it's so important to give that person feedback uh, about what were the results of the testing. Uh, I mean, I think it's just absolutely uh, essential. And then from a psychotherapy perspective, again, really tailoring the treatment to suit this presentation. Julianne mentioned several sorts of therapy, um, and I think all of those could be appropriate. CBT, um, ACT, uh, you know, lots and lots of uh, different approaches, you know, depending on the therapist's training and what the goals of the patient are. But again, very important to socialize into what can you expect from this therapy modality, uh, what, what do you think are the, the number of sessions we'll be meeting, checking in with the person, you know, are you doing assessments, does the person have uh, homework, is homework um, an issue? So for example, for CBT, homework is a major component of ensuring the efficacy of the treatment. And um, again, with older adults, negotiation of homework, probably not calling it homework would be a good uh, way to start, uh, you know, ways that between sessions you can work on some of the uh, skills that we are talking about in session. I mean, that's how I would frame it to a patient. But again, you want to negotiate homework um, and uh, give the person a sense of uh, success in completing it and you're on the same page with the patient. I just have to mention, you know, especially with younger therapists, sometimes there's transference issues and I think whatever treatment modality, you should be alert to transference issues. Um, does this patient remind you of an older adult in your life? older adult see something in you, for especially for younger therapists, you're just like my granddaughter, uh, you know, I think, I think therapists need to be alert to transference. And then finally, all of the literature suggests a more gradual termination of therapy with good supports in place um, and maybe checking in with the person, say, a month after the last face-to-face -face contact is a good idea. I think that's my last slide, so thank you. Thank you very much. That was, a, that was a great presentation, Nancy. And now we'll hear from Dr. Roderick McKay. Rod is a psychiatrist working with older people. He's based in Southwest Sydney. Rod. Okay. Thank you all. And thank you um, for my two previous presenters. I, I think um, it's hard to know exactly how to present this because a lot of the issues that a psychiatrist would go through are very similar to um, have been presented from the social work and the psychologist's perspective. And the thing that's been striking me as they've been talking is the importance of prioritisation. Um, and I think that as um, a psychiatrist is assessing Morris, and definitely as I'd be assessing Morris, I'd be thinking very much, um, what are the key issues? What are the key issues from the point of view of Morris? What are the key issues from the point of view of um, his family? And what are the key issues I need to know about before Morris leaves the room or I leave Morris's house? Because it's very easy to get lost in the complexity um, of an older person. And yet a lot of issues are actually quite simple if you can identify which ones you're going to focus on and be sure about who's going to focus on other things. And I think that comes down to that when a psychiatrist um, is assessing someone like Morris, um, there will be variation in the way they approach things, um, but they'll all have some sort of structure which is in the background to their assessment. And that structure will all um, 
have a respect for Morris's wishes and it will be adapted for the setting of the assessment. And I think very much we're encouraged to take a semi-structured approach and I think that's going back to a lot of the issues that have already been discussed that it's really important to, for rapport and also to get a good history to actually let the patient lead you as much as possible in the assessment but know the areas that you have to cover and then gently guide them to those areas um, if they don't go through them themselves. And it's interesting, if you let someone talk with gentle prompting, how often you can actually, um, how often they do tell you the things that you need to know. In terms of, um, you've heard the words biopsychosocial a few times and I can see in, in the questioning, there's questions about um, spirituality in that and I think there's a lot of different views amongst mental health professionals about whether to go or not go into the area of spirituality. We know spirituality is more important in older people um, and if you're looking at understanding a person's um, fears or lack of fears looking into the future, it can often be an important thing um, to approach, but making sure that you approach it in a way that is the person um, telling you about um, their views about the future and what is important to them in terms of spirituality it's not coming with any assumptions about what their spirituality may be or, um, or um, a lack of spirituality, if you like. If they don't have any firm beliefs, can also be important. Uh, when there's a real lack of any beliefs, I think it's important to think about has that always been the case or is it something which is happening because something else is happening for them? And I'd be particularly worried in that case in terms of depression. Within a biopsychosocial assessment, really what we are we're looking for are uh, what have been the factors that have led up to Morris being in this situation now, what are the things that may have predisposed him to where he is now, so looking at whether there's any biological factors, so is it that he's starting to have some cognitive impairment or not, is it, um, has he got a genetic predisposition for any problems. Um, there's the talk of a accidental overdose by his father. Um, so has, is there any other depression in the family? Is there a family history um, of suicide or not? Maybe something we don't know, but something we need to keep in mind. Then looking at um, what are the precipitating factors, what are the, the things that have been happening very recently, what do they mean for him? And importantly, thinking about what might be the factors that may perpetuate his current problems. But I think the one that really jumps out here um, is both the um, social factors, and even though he has family, it's interesting, is most of his communication is reported as via email. Um, and so the issue about how isolated he does or doesn't feel, and obviously the alcohol um, will be an important factor to assess and to be very cautious in interpreting the responses um, that you're given and that will come on into the issue about collateral history. I think it's really important and something that definitely within a multidisciplinary team and I think though most um, sole psychiatrists would do as well is trying to get the patient's consent to talk with um, someone else as well as them. And I think it's a very interesting question about when you see an older person and there are family present at the time um, whether to see the person first, to see them with the family. Um, I don't think there can be hard and fast rules. I think, again, you have to be led by the patient. It's very important to see the patient alone, um, but in terms of whether that's first or um, after seeing them with the family, I think it's very important to actually ask the person themselves what they think um, and be guided by that. And if I could go on to the next slide. Coming up now. Um, rapport, as we mentioned already, um, really history is um, about 80% um, of your assessment. I think it's one thing we, where we know assessments go wrong is relying too much on the mental state examination. It's very important to go systematically through your mind about what you are seeing in front of you, um, but it's important not to let that override the history you're receiving as well. 
um, and I think it's particularly important in terms of risk assessment and where we know risk assessment goes wrong. Obviously, the history suggests there may be some cognitive impairment. I think it's really important not to assume there is cognitive impairment um, present and therefore you would do some degree of cognitive testing and whether that was informal or formal testing on the initial assessment would very much depend on whether um, the degree of rapport allows formal testing. I think um, the clock drawing test is one which often people will agree to do um, when they're reluctant to do more formal testing. Uh, in, within New South Wales Health, we've actually moved across to using the 3MS rather than the mini mental state examination. And I have to say, I, I think that's a much better instrument. It's the instrument that was um, recommended in the Dementia Outcome Measurement Suite as a preferred instrument for cognitive, brief cognitive testing. It's a little bit longer than the mini mental state examination, but it covers particularly frontal domains as well and it's got greater cross-cultural validity than the mini mental state examination. And so if I did formal testing, it's very likely that's the instrument I would use. I would really be aiming at a problem formulation. Although diagnosis is important, the big thing I'll be trying to identify really is what are the key problems, um, why are they happening, and then starting to think what are we doing about it. In terms of risk assessment, I would um, be very cautious with this history um, about risk assessment. If you think about the factors um, that increase your risk of suicide, um, even though we've got no reported suicide ideation, Morris has a lot of those risk factors. He's over 75, he's male, he lives alone, he's in a rural area, he's been agitated, he may have a family history of depression or suicide, and importantly, um, he started drinking again. Um, so in that situation, it'd be very important both to do um, an assessment regarding suicide in the initial assessment, but also for it to be something that's in the back of your mind in future assessments as well. The other thing I'm very conscious of is the importance of not jumping to an early diagnosis um, unless it's clear it's there because a false diagnosis can be or false positive can really be an uh, issue in itself. I think it's important for all people to be, or all mental health practitioners to be aware that the new national driving um, guidelines actually state that a diagnosis of dementia is automatically associated with a restriction in driving license. Um, and diagnoses of depression or anxiety stick with people to, to say there's a problem and to start thinking about starting treating the problem is one issue. To actually give a clear diagnosis is something I think should be done, but only when you're clear about that. The other thing I think in assessment is really thinking about what are the gaps between Morris's needs and the available supports, and then what is going to be the role of each of the people who are involved. And if we go to the next slide. Coming up now. Um, so, in terms of what the role of the psychiatrist by management will be in management, it really will vary depending on what the um, the requested role is, what the resources are that are available, and the patient's views. My practice um, is mostly within the um, public sector, where I have the um, luxury most of the time of been accessing a multidisciplinary team and we negotiate that um, role within the team. I started working when I only had one nurse I was working with and often worked very similarly to being as a sole practitioner. And it, the role you take on is very different in that. The other thing is really important is actually the patient's views and you may have view about what you want your role to be, but the patient may nego want to negotiate something quite different um, especially regards the role of the psychiatrist and the GP and how they want that balance to work. Um, it will be always important to make sure that um, all three domains of needs are met, the biological, the psychological and the social. So you want to be comfortable there is someone who is looking after Morris's physical health um, 
a psychiatrist is a doctor and, and I would strongly encourage all of my colleagues and I think the majority of psychiatrists um, do make a conscious effort to stay up to date with um, at least their knowledge about current medical issues and so whilst you may or may not be examining the patient you um, physically, you definitely would be taking observations of the patient and thinking about whether what you're seeing matches up with information you're given about their medical needs um, and medical state. You'd obviously be wanting to um, look at their psychological needs and how they're met. Um, and for Morris, I think that the key issue there is, is his alcohol. Um, and really getting a handle on whether that's a minor problem or a major problem and therefore um, whether you feel that the intervention should be focused on possible anxiety or depression or whether they should be focused upon his um, alcohol use initially whilst providing, if you like, supportive measures around his mood problems. And from the psychiatrist's point of view, it almost always consists of varying degrees of direct management, collaborative management with others, and I think really the key issue is, is good communication and coordination with, with the patient and others. And if we could just move on. So in the short term for Morris, I, I think the key issue is, going to, is, is, is psychoeducation for the patient and the family. There seems to be an assumption made by the family that Morris has got major problems. Um, his son is going to um, put the word out to his brothers and sisters and it seems to me, it almost infers the word is that um, dad's going downhill. And so I think it would be really important to actually feed back your assessment and um, I suspect actually that Morris's prognosis should be very good. Um, but you'd be looking out for the factors that mightn't be so good. You'd want to make sure that risk factors are, um, are both identified and there's an agreed approach to either exploring them further or managing them. And I mean, the ones that jump out are alcohol, um, to me, the, the suicide in, in the background and driving, but also thinking very much in a 76-year-old man who's drinking falls um, is actually the, the risk that may um, be most likely to cause an acute deterioration in his lifestyle. Making sure there is management of his medical conditions, making sure there are adequate support and then safe commencement of effective treatment if it's indicated. Um, and I think it's important to make sure it is indicated and that may be um, um, just psychoeducation, it may be starting um, some formal um, psychotherapy and psychiatrists are trained in a range of different therapies. If it was in my practice, I think I'd probably say I, I would use a cognitive behaviourally informed therapy without in any way being formal CBT would be the most likely approach if I was doing something with Morris um, and then considering whether medication was indicated and if it was choosing one with the least side effects and starting at a low dose and monitoring for side effects. And then in the longer term really looking at coming back to re-clarify the diagnosis. We can get it wrong and I think it's very important to um, be quite willing to admit that both to yourself and to others. Um, to term the duration of treatment, if Morris really did have a major depression and he required um, antidepressants, um, he would require them for at least six months and it's very likely um, that he, he may require them for longer. And if this, um, this is presenting as Morris's first present, um, presentation, but if it wasn't his first presentation and he's representing, you'd need to think about uh, more than 12 months to two years in terms of duration. And that's because there's good studies showing that if you stop the treatment early, the chances of relapse um, increase quite markedly. And I think we should move on to people's questions. Thank you very much, Rod. That was a, that was a great presentation. This part of the webinar now is where each uh, panelist will ask, ask each, uh, each of the other panelists a question. Uh, and I'll ask you, Nancy, to ask Juliana a question. I believe you had a question around about um, driving cessation. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, so um, I, my question was, um, what are the potential implications of looming driving cessation from a social work perspective? 
So I really appreciate that question, Nancy. It's fantastic because I think that's, you know, as we've identified, one of the big issues that's um, impacting on Morris at the moment. But I think um, just I just had someone into the room. Hi. No, I'm right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, and I think what we have to look at with Morris is um, the concept of what does losing capacity to be independent um, and in, especially in this life-changing event that's happening to him. Um, I'm sorry, I've just lost my, my concentration. They asked if I wanted a cup of tea. Isn't that lovely being in hospital? I don't think I've ever been asked. <laughs> it's lovely. Sorry about that. I think, yeah, so asking Morris about what does it mean for him to actually what it would be to lose capacity, finding out what it means to him to be able to drive, you know, what are the other multiple losses that he might be experiencing. But I think in the discussions that we had with Morris earlier about his... Um, uh, his strengths and his community supports around him, you know, find out, um, you know, any other supports that might be there, any other groups that are there, other people that are supporting him already. Find out from him what would happen, you know, has he got plan B, you know, plan A is that he, you know, his, his driving would be fine, any issues that he's got, his perspective of his problems, and then, you know, what would happen if he perhaps potentially down the track or now would have to have his licence suspended and what would that look like for him and perhaps get him to elucidate what some of those um, solutions might be to that. Um, I think it's a really difficult one because losing the licence is a bit like when people fall over and fracture their hips. You know, it becomes a real life-changing event for people because it is about um, independence and about you know caring for themselves. And it often is the, the one thing that makes such a difference in people's lives, doesn't it? It does. Yes, yeah. indeed, indeed, Julianne. Thank you very much. No worries. That was a, that was a, that was a really good answer. Now, Rod, I believe uh, that you had a question for Nancy around about um, coordinating care where there are more than two professionals involved. I was just really really um, interested in um, what ways um, Nancy's found have been the most effective strategies um, in coordinating care when there's more than two people involved. It's, it's relatively easy if there's, say, just yourself and the GP, but once mm. there's a third person involved as well, it seems to get quite complex. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I totally agree with that. And in my own clinical practice, I work a lot um, with uh, patients in nursing homes, and so it can get quite complex. Um, I think that it's a good idea to um, have, if you can, a face-to-face -face, um, meeting just to quickly discuss issues. But then, you know, some kind of ongoing, um, whatever seems to be the best strategy to keep um, some ongoing contact is good because some people are more reachable than others. And uh, it would be good, you know, if someone knows that they're not very reachable by um, phone, you might even agree to do uh, some technologically advanced things like texting. <laughs> um, just something to keep, um, you know, communication lines open. And I guess some sort of um, uh, agreement ahead of time that, you know, if there's a major shift, so for example, if the person is hospitalized, that just a quick note to the other uh, professionals involved would be appreciated. And I think that goes a lot towards um, helping those kind of uh, interdisciplinary efforts with the case. <laughs> no, that's a, that's that's a really good answer. Thanks. One of the one of the questions and one of the discussions in the text box, uh, Rod. I'd just like to ask for your comments on this, and you, you did refer to it briefly. Was spirituality and existentialism uh, meaning for life? Would you, would you like to comment on that? I think it's really interesting the range of views people have about whether to explore spirituality or not. Um, within a mental health context. And the range of views vary from, um, and I don't think it's just a discipline-specific issue, but from mental health professionals who feel that there has been, there's a severe risk of abuse of imposing your own views about spirituality, um, even if you don't mean to, or that somehow that all spirituality must be wrong um, which in terms of, um, in a way, imposing their own views about um, atheism or agnostic, agnostic views onto the patient. And therefore, a lot of people avoid the assessment, but we know spirituality is more important um, in older people. And I think it's really important to explore it, even if, and often I would start it with the perspective of looking at it as a social issue. So I'd often start the discussion in the context of person support and I would ask them whether they um, attend any activities, then I'd move on to 
whether they do have any beliefs and whether they um, are something that's an active part of their life or not. Um, mm. And then if the person doesn't want to go further, I wouldn't push it further, but I'd at least let the question be opened up. Yeah, that sounds that sounds very sensible. Julianne, do you have any comments on spirituality, existential? Oh, look, thanks, Michael. I really do because and I love what Rodri said about that. I just think it's really excellent. We've got to start these conversations. A lot of the work I do is with people at end of life, and so we often start with exploring the difference between religion and spirituality, and let people know that you know their social practices of their faith are about you know how they. Um, publicly express their spirituality or their faith but a spirituality is key to each person so we often well my practice I often start with exploring exploring around how people find hope and meaning and ask people about what are the things in their life that give their life meaning you know what is it for them what do they hope for and often those conversations are elicited the things that people do find that give them meaning are the things that are of the spiritual or their fears about what might happen when they die or fears about things that have happened to people that have died previously and so often you can ask people then about, you know, so what are your most fears about dying? And that allows you to explore, well, you know, what might be an afterlife be like? You know, what do you think? Um, you know, you, you just explore those conversations. And I've, I've found in most conversations with people that they're very keen, especially older people, to have these conversations and for us to be the ones that to open them up for them and to give them an opportunity to, virtually to give them permission to have these conversations. So, mm. yeah, I think it's really, really important. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Julianne. Nancy, I can see you itching to, get, <laughs> to say something there. Well, I just, I just wanted to say that someone in the comment uh, stream mentioned the men's shed, oh. and um, <laughs> I think men's shed, that's an excellent you know, suggestion. Like We're talking about it from a mental health uh, professional's perspective, but there's lots of resources in the community, uh, more and more for older adults, and, uh, and I'm a, uh, myself a big fan of um, men's sheds. Um, so I think that it's it's very important to keep those sorts of uh, resources in mind. Yes, and I know that somebody in the in the text box uh, mentioned bushwalking as well. So, <laughs> so, so the, the the old CBT goes a long way. <laughs> and there's very good evidence for exercise in in, in mm. lifting mild depression, yeah, um, as well as doing a whole lot of other good things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Nancy. Um, you had a really good question for Julianne. If she just had one session to work with Mars, what would be the main priority? Julianne, would you like to comment on that? Yes. No, I'll just just one to... session. I think if I just had one session with Morris and knew that I had one, I think it would be just so important to engage with Morris and allow him to, you know, to build the trust and to build the rapport and to show that, because this must be a really scary time for him. If you look at all the issues that he's been identified, you know, he's been in hospital and he's not terribly well engaged at a very emotional level with family, you know, this thing about his dad and, you know, is, is my time come? I think there's a lot of psychological issues here and I think he'd be suspicious, a bit like... Was it Nancy you were saying about the driving cessation? You know, is this mm -hmm. assessment going to mean I'll lose my license? Yeah. Look, I, I think he'd be quite in trepidation of, you know, who are these, you know, people and who are they, what are they asking? What do they want to know all this stuff? You know, are they going to take away my life? Are they going to put me in a home? So I think it's getting his trust and getting his, his um, sense of um, engagement with him so that he could see that what we were doing is really trying to get a sense of who he is and what he, what his life has meant for him and looking at the way not trying to actually put him away but actually find solutions for some of his problems this is where I like what Rod was saying too about you know not jumping to a conclusion about a diagnosis and, and assuming that there's cognitive decline or dementia but actually looking to see what are the other issues so I think my, my role would be, you know, definitely get building rapport, you know, doing some of those things like the genogram and, and talking about his family and his values. I'd probably go straight into a discussion around hope and meaning. You know, what are the things he hopes for? What are his goals? And what is his perception of the issues? And depending on how long I'd have with him, you know, often you've only got an hour, an hour and a half tops with a family, with a, an individual, and, and generally by then you're they're exhausted anyway, is just to try and get some permission to sort of either refer on to the next most appropriate healthcare professional or refer back to his GP or a psychogeriatric team if possible, or to try and get him to engage so that, you know, that there was some flow onto somewhere else, that you weren't the only clinician, you know, that only opportunity to make some change. Um, does that answer your question yeah, that's there? A, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a really good answer, I think. Nancy, what do you reckon? I reckon. <laughs> she lovely. Okay, now, Rod, you had asked this question, but I'm going to put it back on to you. <laughs> Could you just comment about access 
for people who live in rural areas. And many of our clinicians live in quite rural areas. Um, and unfortunately, your, your video has dropped out because you're still on audio. How does being in a rural area affect access to and collaboration with other professionals? Just from your experience, it's possibly as, as a registrar or in a, in a previous life. Um, my experience in terms of rural areas is a bit twofold. One is direct and one is indirect. Um, I regularly have meetings with rural professionals and they um, talk both with the challenges of travel time and being able to access people as frequently as they like, but then actually when they discuss that with their colleagues in the city, they find that actually um, getting through um, peak hour traffic or just getting access to a car actually makes those problems quite similar between rural and mm -hmm. urban in many ways. And I think that the main strength they bring out is because services are smaller, people often know each other much better, and so the informal collaborative networks actually seem stronger often in rural areas. So I think there's real pros and cons mm. of um, in rural areas. And in many ways, I actually think that um, for someone like Morris, his um, supports may actually be stronger in some rural areas definitely than in outer metro. Yes, because he may have been a member of a club or something, and he may in a small mm. town, and the club may may rally around. So yep. familiarity is very important. Mm. That's what you're saying. Yeah, but that's good. Nancy, do you have any comments on that? On the well, I think that um, I'd agree with that, uh, that there's a different kind of support uh, network in um, rural areas that may actually, uh, you know, have more of a safety net. And um, and that even extends to driving in terms of, uh, you know, people uh, having better access to where they need to go, sometimes in a rural setting, sometimes it's worse. Um, I think it really depends on um, how long the person's been in that setting, do they have family, um, you know, is this, um, you know, a, a sea or a, a tree change and they haven't been there that long because um, that sometimes happens. Um, I mean, I think you really have to see how that person fits into the context of their environment. Um, but I uh, also agree that rural doesn't necessarily equal less, um, less support. Yep. Judy Ann, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course, Michael. How do you handle, um, I'm a GP, but how do you handle difficult GPs? <laughs> Everybody's itching to ask that question. <laughs> Do you want my, my real that. answer or my polite? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we've had it texted in as well. Have you? Look, I think it's. Um, I think we're all faced with those issues and pressures, and you know we've all found a few care professionals, whether they're GPs or whether they're social workers or others. Look, I find the best things, and it's that old adage, you know, keep your enemies close. You know, I don't know whether that works, but I think it's about engaging well. Sometimes a difficult GP is just one who's extremely busy or doesn't like the paperwork or finds, you know, that previous engagement with healthcare professionals, especially mental health professionals, hasn't been necessarily positive. Um, I often see it as a bit of a challenge to actually to try and engage well by writing letters, by you know dropping notes, or you know ensuring that there's you know documentation for him. And I just think it's just that constant persistence of respectful practice. Sometimes you can't win them over, and I think that's just one of those things that you have to accept that um, you know, or even advocate you know for the patient to find a better GP, perhaps that might be more engaging or, or more willing to work collaboratively. Mm. And uh, my quiet answer is in the back of my mind, I have a piece of 4B2, and I just go, <laughs> 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 But I didn't say that in public, did I? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Would anybody like to comment on who should lead the multidisciplinary team, or should it have a leader? Should, should a leader just emerge? Uh, it's right. I, I, I actually do have some strong views here. I, I think in the Australian system, and I think it is to do with the system we're working, it's really important that the GP remains... Um, at the core and so even if we have a case manager the GP is still very clearly from our perspective we tell the GP and the family the GP is, is the core person um, and so that would be my perspective. Nancy? I, I mean I'd have to agree I mean I uh, you know I, I think that there really has to be someone who's the, the, the nominated um, 
you know, someone who's coordinating things. And I do think in the Australian system it is the GP. I mean, I, I will just comment that, you know, sometimes there is a difficult GP. It's not really, a, you know, it's difficult that, that the person may not have a lot of experience with older adults. I mean, that, that's really the main thing that I strike. And, um, and uh, there I think that, you know, oftentimes if there's just a good collaboration, you can actually get people on board and working together quite well, even in that circumstance. Would anybody like to comment, uh, just lastly, we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately, indigenous and uh, multicultural issues. Anybody like to? Julianne? Uh, from what perspective, Michael? Uh, from well, just, to, you know, does it, does it make a difference? Are we, you know, should we mm. be conscious of, of different uh, spiritual? Absolutely. Look, I think it does make a difference. But I think, you know, if we're working authentically, and I, I feel quite passionate about this, if we're working authentically with all peoples, then we should be very conscious of all cultural sensitivities across all population groups, whether they appear to be first, you know, like first Australians or fourth generation Australians. Mm. You know, everybody has some cultural sensitivities that I think we need to be very conscious of. And... You know, and I just think just concentrating our cultural competence and sensitivity just to Indigenous or vividly, you know, evidenced, you know, first Australians and ignoring the cultural sensitivities of third and fourth generation Australians perhaps is ignoring the full gamut of cultural sensitivity that should be, we be, should be, oh, I'm getting tongue-tied, applying in our professional practice. So I think we do need to be very sensitive to the nuances of Indigenous people and multicultural groups and, you know, how to relate to them and what I need to know in order to effectively develop rapport with certain groups of people because there are rules of engagement and rules about behaviour and who you can and can't talk to. I think that's critically important. But I think we must, as authentic professionals, use that cultural sensitivity across all groups. So. Okay, that's good. Nancy, do you have any comments on that? Well, I just think, you know, just switching into assessment mode, I really think, uh, you know, the tests you choose uh, for people from called or um, linguistically diverse or culturally diverse backgrounds is key, um, you know, if, if possible, to, to choose assessments that are tailored um, to that group. And I will uh, just um, make a plug. There is a, an Aboriginal uh, Indigenous assessment tool, the Kika, um, that was developed out in the Kimberley um, that is a um, sort of a version of the mini mental yeah. um, or a mental status exam uh, for Indigenous Australians. So I think there's a lot of interesting things happening in instrument development uh, for this group and, um, and taking some care here is time well spent. Mm. Rod, do you have any comments on that? Um, I, I would agree with both comments, although my views have changed a little recently because um, with my state role, we actually had quite extensive consultations between um, a senior policy person who was Aboriginal and Aboriginal elders about their views about what it meant in terms of connection. And um, that has changed my views to a degree. I, I think there are particular issues about recognition um, of the status of Aboriginal people and the role of elders and their expectation that there will be an Aboriginal person involved in some way in the care that I think we need to respect. And so my views have changed slightly. So I would mostly agree. I think we should be culturally sensitive to everyone. Um, and I think it's where we often fall down as mental health professionals, mm. is impo imposing our values. But my, my views are changing a bit. And, mm. and that report actually either is or will shortly be available from the New South Wales Health website. Oh, Wonderful. Good. Thanks for that. Good. Now, unfortunately, it, the time just goes too quickly on these webinars, unfortunately. Um, it's now time to spend two minutes each summing up, and I will put you off after two minutes. Julianne. Oh. You can sum up. You can talk. Look, I just think I just want to thank everyone for this opportunity. I have learned so much listening to Nancy and Rod and Phil because I haven't had a lot of exposure to psychologists and psychiatrists. I'm a rural uh, social worker in private practice, and even when I was working in the health sector, you know, we were very rarely had access to psychologists and psychiatrists in our region especially you know, at that interface. And I just feel listening to you and getting an understanding of, of how you would work and the, the roles that you would take, the assessments that you would do, the more formal summation of issues and concerns, 
you know, I can see that by having exposure to this and thinking, you know, about having a case that we've actually used as a focus allows me as a social worker to think, you know, where do we fit into this, you know, to get the rhythm right, you know, to where do we fit, you know, where would we start, what would we do, how would we complement each other. And I think this is perhaps what we need a lot more of is this understanding of the nuances of each professional's roles and their interpretation of, of presenting issues and problems. And I just think I, I can't thank the panel enough for your generosity and, um, and you know, this respectful professional practice. I just think it's, it's been a great opportunity for me. So thank you. Thanks very much, Gideon. Nancy, you've got two minutes. Two minutes. Well, I'd also like to extend my thanks. I've learned uh, a lot from uh, Julianne and Rod, but I've also learned uh, quite a bit. I, I'm loving, uh, you know, hearing everyone's uh, comments on the message uh, board, especially about things like um, spirituality and an and existential sense, because that certainly was what uh, drew me into the case. Um, you know, we often, uh, especially in nursing homes, we talk about person-centered care, um, I find it hard sometimes to conceptualize not having that person in the center of care when I'm working with older adults. And, and so many things in this case that we've talked about, you know, the, the, the premature death of his father, him feeling his time is up, um, this really sad um, story he's told himself about his wife and uh, this, this not making things right with her, um, before she died. You know, these are the kinds of stories that draw you into cases with older adults. I love working with older adults, and I'm so pleased that so many people have chosen to tune into this webinar um, to discuss uh, an interesting case, and um, I'm very pleased. Thank you very much, Nancy. That was lovely. Rod? I'll take a totally different tact. I think it's been a great experience. I think it's a learning experience all around. Um, and I think one of the great things with older people is they teach us so much. Um, and it would be really interesting if, if we actually had Morris here to actually hear his views um, about what was going on and whether he really had a problem or not. Um, but but the, other th the, the other thing, I think the most important thing is, is to emphasise that most older people are well, healthy and enjoying life. Mm. Um, and one thing as health professionals we can really do is we get the perception that being old is about being sad and it is about um, having lots of problems. And actually it's, at 76, Morris is still a youngster. Um, most of the people, I, I mean, our average age, I think, of people we see is now about 76. Um, and that's because we have quite a few, unfortunately, of, of quite young people who come in with age-related problems. At 76, a lot of people are very active, very healthy, enjoying life, and that's why it's so important to be worried if someone is older and they're not enjoying life. Um, and the other side is they've still got a lot of resilience. And I, as I said earlier, I suspect that Morris actually could do very well um, with some simple interventions. And I think everyone um, can really contribute to that. And that's what I'd encourage people to do is to realise they can make a difference. Thanks very much, Rod. That was, that was very thoughtful, very thoughtful statement. You actually stole my thunder because I was going to say that Morris is a silent witness to all this because, as um, Anne-Marie S. said uh, in the textbooks, we will all be older one day. Mm. So it is interesting that we are looking from inside the cube out and outside the fishbowl in. So I am uh, speechless. It, it's been such a great evening. Um, I, I, I'm very privileged to be able to sit here and just listen to these uh, month after month, and this has been an excellent webinar, probably one of the best I've attended. Um, Julianne, speaking from a hospital bed, <laughs> um, took us through um, how social workers approach, uh, approach um, a case like this, the genogram, the echogram, negotiating with, uh, with healthcare professionals and respecting the, respecting, uh, the person, using your intuition, um, uh, and uh, being conscious of the rhythm and the tone of the consultation, and I think that's that's really important. The consultation is one of my one of my pet hobbies. We then moved on to Nancy's presentation. She stressed um, again the biopsychosocial approach, which everybody has talked about tonight, and including in, in the textbooks. She discussed the many assessment and tools that are available, and she will, I'm sure, post those up. 
uh, on MHBN because many of our, our audience just weren't able to pick up on, on all the assessment tools, but that would be great if you could, Nancy. Sure. Um, I was particularly interested in, in the discussion about about giving feedback um, and also the transference issues that, are gonna, that can occur. And I think it's really, really important that we give feedback. If we do an assessment on somebody, we give we give the person the feedback. And also, you did stress, uh, as you added, building rapport. Um, and then Rod's um, presentation discussed the key issues, being Morris, his family, and also the therapist, the effect that that, that managing um, a patient like Morris and his family has. Um, and I think Rod quite rightly stressed that we should have a respect for Morris's wishes. Um, he also stressed that we should always approach these interviews in a semi-structured way. Uh, and letting the patient lead, you will often get more information as, as, as you are stressed by gently leading the patient. Um, the effects of alcohol and medication and illness uh, on the person uh, were stressed by Rod. And also the importance of, of psychoeducation, not only of, of Morris, but also of his family. I've only touched on, on a few of the key messages, but I think we can all take from this presentation tonight that we all need to work collaboratively uh, as uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, mental health nurses, occupational therapists, GPs, anybody who's involved with older people. So I am going to have to bring this to an end. I, I would like to thank our, our panelists, um, Julia, Nancy, and Rod, and I would also like to thank uh, those audience members who uh, logged in tonight, and I trust that we will see you all again at another MHPN webinar. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Thanks good night. so much. It was really wonderful. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Nancy. Not Rod. Good night, Michael. Good night, good night everybody. <laughs> Sleep well. Bye. <laughs> Sleep well, Julia. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs>